Occasionally, I saw some medias use Robert Stanley National Parliament to name Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, let's say CPPCC. In this video, let's talk about CPPCC. Hopefully, after this video, we have a better picture about who CPPCC is. Hello, my name is Jingyin Zhang. Welcome to my YouTube channel. Middle Kingdom Law Insider. Through my channel, I explain China law for you. The first question is, who is CPPCC? More accurately, CPPCC is a political advisory body in China's political structure, and it is also a democratic oversight organization to the ruling party in China. CPPCC is led by the Chinese Communities Party, in short, CCP. However, among all members, CCP members are just a small part of big family. CPPCC consists of members from various groups and individuals, including members or representatives from CCP, democratic parties, people's groups, associations, ethnic minorities, industry sectors in Hong Kong, Macau, and even Taiwan. The proportion of representation of various parties associations is negotiated between the parties and determined by the standing committee of CPPCC. Unlike typical competition between political parties, the nature of CPPCC is to unite the people to work together. Before the founding of New China in 1949, China created the United Front to work with people from different political backgrounds. CPPCC is the most inclusive organization on the United Front. The United Front, including CPPCC, was led by CCP and was a coalition of all Chinese people dedicated to rebuilding China at that time. CPPCC is a unique way of democracy under single-party leadership in China. Through conversations, negotiations, and consultations, CPPCC oversees and supports CCP to lead the nation and society to right direction. Actually, CPPCC was not created by CCP alone. After ending Japanese invasion in 1945, a political consultative conference in short, PCC, was initiated by CCP and Nationalist Party to discuss how to get China recovered from the war. From 1945 to early 1946, PCC was held in Chongqing by the Nationalist Party, Communist Party, Democratic League, Youth Party, and other independent political leaders for peaceful transition to a new government. The purpose of PCC was to discuss the future of China. The conference started from January 1st and ended on January 31st in 1946 with a final resolution reached in resolving five major issues. The first one is how the government structure should be. The second one was what was the political agenda to organize a new government, how to resolve the miniature issues, and how to organize the National Congress, and finally, what the Constitution should be. However, 
The resolution was soon toned by the Nationalist Party in late 1946. The civil war between the Nationalist Party and CCP got into the final battle stage. On April 30, 1948, in order to unite all possible forces to end the civil war and to build a more united government, CCP called on to organize another political consultative conference. CCP's call was well responded. In April 1949, CCP conquered Nanjing and ended the Nationalist Party's ruling in China. In September 1949, new political consultative conference was held in Beijing and was called Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. From now on, we can call it as a CPPCC. A joint charter was passed by CPPCC, which acted as interim constitution for a new China. From 1949 to 1953, CPPCC acted as an interim congress. On September 20, 1954, China passed its first constitution. The new constitution replaced the joint charter of CPPCC. According to constitution, the National People's Congress let's say NPC, was established to replace CPPCC. The question then was, what the legal status of CPPCC was after all these changes? So, the functions of CPPCC as the interim congress has already been replaced by newly established NPC. However, the organization of CPPCC has remained because it is the main force of the United Front. Since then, CPPCC has been an organization with political oversight function. Both CCP and CPPCC have unique position based on China's constitution. Alternatively, CPPCC's authority to oversee the ruling party is based on the highest law in the land. CPPCC is not the parliament of China in nature, but a political advisory body with function of democratic oversight. To define CPPCC as a Chinese parliament is not correct. Now, let's talk about the relationship between CCP and CPPCC. The relationship between CCP and CPPCC is not as simple as the one between a ruling party and opposition party. First, CPPCC is a part of a united front, of which eight democratic parties are central part of it. Second, CPPC is a united force under the leadership of CCP. Most of the time, CPPCC helps CCP to lead the nation to the right direction. So, the better way to define the relationship between CCP and CPPCC is supportive and overseeing. CCP is the ruling party, but CPPCC supports and oversees its leadership in ruling the nation. This is embedded in CPPCC's six words guiding principle: 长期共存,互相监督,肝胆相照,荣辱以共. To translate it in English, it means long-term coexistence, mutual oversight, sincerity to each other, and glory and hardship sharing. In my view, if you look at the historical relationship during China's civil war, the relationship between CCP and other democratic parties is more like a brotherhood. In the past, CCP was the leading force at the front. The democratic parties were the supportive forces behind. The history created a brotherhood relationship between CCP and other democratic parties. Today, reunification and national rejuvenation have become the new mission for this brotherhood relationship. Each year, CPPCC and NPC parallel their meetings at the same time. This gives people impression they are similar government bodies. However, 
The fact is, they are not. MPC is China's legislative body. CPBCC is a political oversight and advisory body, although they function differently. However, MPC and CPPCC can interact with each other. For example, CPPCC's standing members are always invited to attend MPC's meetings. Many CPPCC members are also the representatives to the National People's Congress through the election process. CPPCC's main function include political consultation, political oversight, political participation, and deliberation. The purpose of CPPCC is to improve the democracy under the single party leadership and to open our doors for the ruling party to listen what the people have to say and what the people are concerned about. Political consultation means the consultation and the negotiation for policy making and implementation. This allows CPPCC to participate in major policy making process and monitor execution and implementation of the policies. Political oversight means CPPCC can criticize and provide counsel for implementation of laws, policies, and government practice. This allows CPPCC from time to time to oversee the ruling party's work. Political participation and the deliberation are the extension of political consultation and oversight. Through political participations and the deliberations program, CPPCC can investigate, do field study, and then provide constructive feedback to ruling party and the government. So, how could CPPCC carry out these functions? CPPCC can do many things. For example, annual national meeting, standing committee meetings, various political consultation meetings, advisory proposals to the state council, advice or reports from the special committees of CPPCC, field studies, CPPCC members, tips and critics, participating in inspections or investigations organized by the ruling party or the government. Among all, the most important one is the political motion that CPPCC files from time to time to carry out its advisory and oversight function. However, now the question is, what is the CPPCC's political motion? A political motion is a written opinion or advice prepared and submitted by a member of CPPCC or a party, a member group of CPPCC, a special committee of CPPCC, or CPPCC's standing committee. A political motion must be formalized through a review mechanism. The formalized political motion must be answered and responded by the named government branch, or CCP, in the motion. Here are the basic steps for a political motion to get a response from the government. First step. After the political motion has been received from an initiator, say, a CPPCC member. CPPCC will review and formalize it into a written political motion. Second step, the motion then will be submitted and communicated to the named government branch, or CCP, for processing. Third step, the named government branch, or CCP, must check and review each matter mentioned in the political motion and then take action to address the issues. Finally, a formal written response, typically in a form of letter, for how the government or CCP has handled issues raised in motion. Finally, a formal written response, typically in a form of letter, for how the government or CCP has handled issues raised in motion, must be sent back to CPBCC. In other words, each political motion 
must have a formal answer from the government or CCP. How they handle the issues. As a matter of fact, all formal answers to the political motions are published. This offers a critical way for CPPCC's political oversight to the ruling party and the government. Published answers to the political motions often become guidance for the government practice. One question people might ask what is the difference between CPPCC's political motion and MPC's legislative motion. Legislative motion is part of lawmaking process. The legislative motion only happens during the meeting session of MPC or its standing committee and can only be proposed by certain people in certain ways. It does not happen when MPC is not in a meeting session. The MPC's legislative motion has legal consequence when it is passed, it becomes law. CPPCC's political motion is part of its political oversight function. CPPCC motion can be raised at any time by any member for any subject. There is no rule setting up requirements for a political motion. So in certain sense, a political motion is more like a piece of advice or a critique addressed through a formal channel to the government or the ruling party. However, unlike MPC's legislative motion, CPPCC political motion does not have legal consequences, but a sole power to guide or to warn the government's practice. In recent years, CPPCC has been more active in participating in China's political and social affairs, for example. People can see many Democratic Party's members are holding important government positions. The political motion is a very important way for CPPCC to oversee China's government and ruling party's leadership. Here's one of the latest data for the political motions submitted by CPPCC and processed by Chinese government. In the third meeting, of the 13th National Committee of CPPCC. By May 22, 2020, 5,709 political motions in total has been submitted, among all of which 4,967 motions had been formalized by CPPCC. Mainly, the motions submitted by CPPCC are about issues relating to economic development, political structure adjustment, cultural establishment, social and ecosystem development, etc. Based on the data, most of political motions came from 1,944 individual members of CPPCC, which was comprised of 90.38% of total number of motions by CPPCC. In all motions, about 40% are about economic development. Unlike the United States, a lot of social issues have to be addressed through Congress by fighting and arguments. In China, CPPCC's political motions will be addressed right away by the government. Chinese way is to look at the issue and try to resolve it. American way is to fight for issue and only the winner take the issue forward. This is one of many reasons why China has a more effective way in handling the social problems. CPPCC is a unique landscape in the world politics. The core value of CPPCC can be described in two words, unity and democracy. Under the leadership of CCP, CPPCC is a united force to exercise democracy. Because of that, China in the past 40 years has been on the right direction to develop its economy and social society. Without a unity and democracy, China could not develop its economy and improve people's life standards so fast. History has always been a reflection to what a country has become. Without the nationalist parties breaking off the resolution reached by different political parties, 
and leaders in 1946. Today's China might have become more like the United States, where two major parties compete in the political arena. After break off, the Nationalist Party had lost its support and the CCP won the war. CCP had learned a lesson from the Nationalist Party. Fish should never leave water. This is the whole story where CPPCC came from and why it still exists. How to choose a way of democracy? Each country has to find their own answer based on their own history and reality. CPPCC is a unique political structure in modern democratic society. The way of CPPCC might not apply to any other countries, but its existence answers two questions. Could a country led by a single party be democratic? Could different parties be united to work together? I would invite you to think about these two questions. I hope this video has given you some answers to the opening question, who CPPCC is. This is Middle Kingdom Law Insider. My name is Jing Zhan. Thank you for your watching. See you next time.